The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Praise God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a glorious text found in the Psalms that just brightens my spirit. And I want to thank each one of you for joining us on Wonderfully Made today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules wherever you might be throughout the world to learn about your bodies. The body is actually our gift from God, and how we take care of it is very, very important. Because if I gave you a good Cadillac, you'd certainly take good care of it. Today's topic is going to be on valvular heart disease. And I want to welcome uh, Mr. Daniel Miller here today to join us. He's a businessman from Chattanooga who's also a heart consumer. And Dan, what are you doing on a, on a health care set? A businessman coming? What's your, you know, what, what interest do you have in, in valvular heart disease? Well, um, that's a good question. At my age, Sooner or later, everyone starts wondering and asking themselves, how do you want your quality of life to be as you get older? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Well, have you noticed that, that as the bod body ages, and I'm not saying you're old, but as the body ages, you notice more abnormalities or things that don't feel quite as right? Yeah. Well, what's, um, what's some of the first things you've noticed? Just getting out of bed for one. Okay. <laughs> You know, as w when we're younger, we don't realize the effects on our bodies that we have as we live our lives. And as w when we're younger, obviously, we're harder on our systems. One of the, uh, the effects that I have are, are more joint pains. Um, you have more shortness of breath. Um, you have different things like that, that that do make you kind of wonder about how you're doing it. Well, one of the things that, that I tell my patients is, you know, you, you only get one body, and the body is a machine. And, you know, most, I, I don't know how you are, but most men, especially men seem to be more guilty than women, most men take better care of their cars You're right. than they do their bodies. I mean, when was the last time you had a physical? Put you on the spot here. It's been about three months. Three months. Well, that, that's better than most. <laughs> I have some people, mainly men, that will come, and they only come when something breaks down. But I want to talk to our audience around the world. It's very important to get health maintenance as well. Now, do you, you know, we talked a little bit about being a steward. A lot of people don't see their bodies as gifts and they're stewards and responsible for taking care of this gift. Right. Um, do you think as you get older, you, you see yourself more as a steward of a gift that's been given? And why do we abuse it so much when we're younger? Why do we, we think we take it for granted or we just mature? Well, there's, there's two, two or three different things. As you're, when you're younger, for one, you feel like you're invincible. Uh -huh. um, you know, you're out, you know, jumping off from cliffs, you know, diving into lakes, um, you know, go parachuting, and you don't know, think about the parachute not opening. Yeah. Um, as you get older, you start thinking about those things more, and I, I would assume that that's probably some of the, the reasons for that. Well, I want our audience today to keep that in mind that our bodies are a gift from God. And, right. and it's one of the greatest gifts. You know, we have the gift of time, the gift of our bodies, um, the gift of our resources and jobs. And um, I'm glad you're interested about your body. I'm glad you joined us here today, Dan. Well, what we've been doing is we collect questions in HeartWise Ministries from all over the world about people that are interested in their hearts and want to know more. Um, and the next thing we do is we try to group these on a specific subject. And today's subject, we're going to answer questions from all over is in regard to valvular heart disease. Right. So with that introduction, let's, let's get on with some questions here. Okay. Our first question, Jim, is from Calvin in Mississippi. Um, he writes, the doctor told me I have a leaky heart valve. What does this mean? Okay. Um, a leaky heart valve in your heart between the chambers of your heart, you have little fibrous structures that open and close. 
Um, there's one that comes in from the right side of the heart. That's called a tricuspid valve because it has three leaflets that open and close. Then the blood goes into the lungs through another valve called the pulmonic valve. Then it gets oxygen inside the lung. Then it comes back to the left side of the heart and goes through another valve called the mitral valve. Then it goes into the big pumping chamber called the left ventricle. Then it's pumped out through another valve called the aortic valve. All of these valves open and shut. Now the reason the valves open and shut is we don't want blood to go backwards. We want it to be moving forward with oxygen. Right. If it was all moving backwards, we wouldn't accomplish very much. The blood that moves backwards, this is not a good situation. And when it moves backwards, sometimes we say you have a leaky heart valve. Another name for that is called regurgitation. Right. Um, if you have a leaky heart valve, Dan, if you had a leaky valve at home, let's say your faucet leaks, what would be the first thing you would do for a faucet if it leaks? Making, making noises, you know, things, things are going in the wrong direction. Well, the first thing we'd do probably would be call a plumber. That's what I would do is I'm call a plumber. I'm good at that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> okay, I'll call a plumber. Uh, the second thing I think would be to have him replace the valve. Exactly. And sometimes when the leak gets so bad that it bothers us so much, we have to replace a valve. And, you know, we don't just jump into that. Um, right. and it's something we um, consider very closely. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, let's bring up our first graphic today on leaky heart valve. Here's our, you know, we talk about, well, leaky heart valve. Well, what can cause a heart valve to leak or the blood move backwards in the wrong direction? Well, one of them is called high blood pressure. And the way high blood pressure does is it stretches things out in the heart. And sometimes it actually stretches the valve the where it closes. And that closing point is called coaptation. If it closes this point, sometimes the blood can leak backwards. Also, sometimes you can have infections on your heart valve, and of course, this damages it from the infections. Another thing is the valves need to, blood supply and oxygen to open and close, so if you don't get a good blood supply or oxygen from coronary artery disease, the valve can also leak. Another condition that can cause it is actually where your heart gets weak. When a heart gets weak, the valve can't close like it normally would because it's pulled apart because the heart tries to adapt, and then the valve leaks anymore. So that's some of the um, causes of a leaky heart valve. Now back to, to Calvin. Um, I hope that explained what the leaky heart valve means. Fortunately, Calvin, most people have leaky heart valves to a, a certain degree, and that's not a major problem just having a little leak. Let me ask you this. W what kind of tests are conducted to... Excellent question. Well, the most, the most basic test is a stethoscope. Okay, and I'm sure you've seen it when you go right. to the doctors. You can actually hear the blood flow going in the wrong d direction. Mm -hmm. It sounds a, a sort of swishing sound. You might hear a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Normally the valve's open and closed, but when you hear a swishing sound, sometimes that can be a sign that the heart valve is not leaking or not working well. Because right. that's actually what cardiologists listen to, the opening and closing of the valve. That's the lub-dub that you hear in the heart. Um, another thing that we want to that we look at heart valves with is a fancy machine called a, an echocardiogram where we make sound wave pictures and we can bounce them off the heart valves right. and we can create a visualization of the valve opening and closing. We also have fancy maneuvers and equations where we can quantitate how much blood is leaking back or forward. So this might give us a clue um, to whether the valve needs. So that's how we find out. But usually a patient comes to us if it's bad, they have a symptom. Right. So, uh, let me ask you this, does stress add to that? It could if it raises your blood pressure cause of it. Usually stress itself won't damage the valve primarily, but it might do it secondarily. Right, okay. All right. Um, and then a person would have a symptom. And the most common symptom I see when heart valves are leaky is, is shortness of breath. People can't breathe mm -hmm. very well. Okay, let's right. go next, next question here. Okay, question number two is from Margaret in Connecticut. And she writes, I had a heart valve surgery and have to take Coumadin. Okay. However, I have a friend who also had a valve replaced who doesn't take Coumadin. Mm. We were recently at a women's meeting and got into a big discussion about whether she should be taking Coumadin or not. I'm usually right about health care issues. My friend wanted me to ask you to settle the debate. Well... Now there you can either solidify that friendship or 
Okay, well, they're having a big discussion. I hope that big discussion was not an argument, Margaret, um, about who should be taking Coumadin or not. Um, I hope that, you know, both people could be right. How, how do you like that for a middle-of-the-road answer? <laughs> I think both great. people could be right, and let me explain a little bit. When you have a heart valve that's been replaced, we have different types of heart valves that go in there, and the decision is made based on numerous factors. Well, one type of valve is stainless steel. We call that a metallic heart valve. Right. That's not normal for a person to have a metallic heart valve. So that type of patient, sometimes there can get clots on the valves. That patient, if a clot got on the valve, that would not be good because right. it could be pumped up and it could cause an occlusion of a blood vessel. Those type of patients would definitely need to be placed on Coumadin. Now, in other instances, we decide to put a tissue valve or a valve or tissue from, sometimes we get them from a pig. Right. Sometimes we can get it from a cow. Sometimes we get it from the outside lining of a heart, of a cadaver. Right. And those tissue valves can sometimes be put into the heart valve position. Um, some people cannot take Coumadin. Women of childbearing years, you have to be very careful with Coumadin because Coumadin can damage the baby if you were to become pregnant. Right. So those people would be, you know, we'd have to really consider whether you put on Coumadin. Um, some patients bleed a lot. Right. And in that situation, Dan, we would want um, to keep people away from Coumadin, which could make them bleed more. Um, thinking about that situation, some people have diseases of the bone marrow, where the bone marrow doesn't make red blood cells, and they're more prone to bleed. Just a simple car, uh, you know, an accident. I won't want to say simple, but if you cut yourself and you're anemic and you have lots of bleeding, that would put you at a very high risk of being on Coumadin. And in those situations, um, we might decide to put in a, a valve that's not metallic, either Correct. one of these pig valves or a cow valve, cow valve, or even a pericardial valve. Um, let's put up our second graphic here, um, talking about Coumadin a little bit. Our second graphic, is, um, who needs Coumadin? And I think that's the heart of Margaret's question here. These patients definitely, with metallic valves, need to be placed on Coumadin to prevent the risk of blood clots. Another group that needs it is, is a group that has atrial fibrillation. That's where the top part of the heart beats asynchronous with the bottom. In this situation, regardless of what type of valve you have, you're going to need on, to be on Coumadin anyway if you can. So in these type of patients, we say, well, let's go ahead and put a metallic valve in. The third situation is any other situation where you have blood clots in your body. Right. Um, sometimes blood clots gets in the legs and they go to the lungs. Those type of situations would need to be on Coumadin as well. Um, a, a situation where a blood clot gets in the lung is called a pulmonary embolism. Um, I don't know if you remember that reporter that was in um, overseas a few uh, months ago, um, but he was in um, Iraq and I think he was in a tank and he, he couldn't move his legs. And when he couldn't move his legs, he got a blood clot there. That blood clot dislodged. So inactivity brought it on. Exactly. And then being in the same, and it went all the way into his lungs and he had a pulmonary embolism and that was a fatal event for him. So but, is, does exercise then prevent yes, this kind of situation? Yes, that's why in, in an airplane, if you're going on a long trip, you know, they say you should get up and move your legs every, right. every so many hours if you're in a long car, car trip. In fact, if we sit down here too much, we might want to stand up so right. we don't have a chance of having our, our venous system get a clot. But if you did have a clot um, on that system and it did go to your lungs and it wasn't fatal, you would, uh, that would be another candidate that would be, need to be on Coumadin. Right. Margaret, I hope we answered your question here today. Um, I hope it didn't cause you too much um, problems with your friend, but in your situation, it's possible that you're both right. Now, how is that for a diplomatic answer to that question? Okay, Jim, here's our, here's our third question. This question comes from Rasmus in Norway. Hmm. How does an infection get on a heart valve? Rasmus, that is a very insightful question. A lot of people don't even realize that infections can get on heart valves. One of the more common ways that an infection gets on a heart valve is through some type of germ that invades the blood system. The most common, one of the most common dirty places where germs lives is our mouths. And frequently, well not frequently, but sometimes we have an infection or a tooth that's pulled or we have some mouth procedure, a dental procedure and a bug that's in our mouth gains access to our bloodstream. That bug gets in the bloodstream and floats around in the bloodstream. Sometimes even in a perfectly normal heart valve, 
that bacteria can get on that heart valve right. and it just sticks there. And guess what bacteria love to eat? Blood. It's, right. it's just, they love that blood. It's just like a constant food source for them. So they grow and they set up shop there. And before you know it, they have a family there and they keep, and then all of a sudden they start munching on that valve and, and it destroys the valve. But also people are prone to get heart um, infections that if they have valves that are abnormal to begin with. Right. If you're born with a congenital abnormality of the valve or the valve is not right, then it sees a bacteria and they're more prone to stick on these valves and it causes an infection. So um, that's one of the ways um, an infection gets on a heart valve. Um, another one is through the skin. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in hospitals we see people that have IVs. That's a device that goes into a vein. If that gets an infection or dirty or it's been in a long time, that's another way that bacteria from the skin gain right. access to the bloodstream and the same process can occur. Right. Now, are there different types of infections? Oh, yeah. There's different. Most of the serious infections on the heart tend to be bacteria infections. Right. Um, one of the most serious ones, one called staph. Another one's called strep. These are types of bacteria, and there's numerous bacteria that can gain access to the bloodstream. But any pathogen or abnormal bug that gets in the blood, whether it be a fungus, um, a bacteria, some viruses, anything that gains access that can start living on these valves can potentially get on it and destroy a heart valve. So basically what you've been saying is that bad oral hygiene mm -hmm. can affect it mm -hmm. or bring it on. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you this, how about body piercings? Oh, that is an excellent thing to bring up, Dan. More and more people now are getting body piercings. Um, they get them pierced in the nose, in the ears, in the belly button. But the one, I saw this not too long ago, I saw a piercing in the tongue. Mm. And that piercing was right in the middle of the tongue and the person would eat lots of food. Now this was uh, someone in their 20s. Right. And that tended to, it got infected and I don't know whether it was from the food or because of the hygiene or it might have been the person that pierced it wasn't sterile. Right. That got infected, a bacteria had access to the bloodstream. The next thing that happened was it deposited on a heart valve and this, this is a, took time and four or five months later um, this patient was fatigued and tired. They came in, we heard a rip-roaring heart murmur because the valve couldn't close anymore because right, right. it had a big old hole where those bacteria just munched away. Right. Big leakage, we, we did an echocardiogram and we could see the growing bacteria on the valve. And at that point, um, it was to the place we couldn't treat it with antibiotics, which is what we do if it was small. It was leaking so bad, bad that in this 24 year old, we had to place a metallic heart valve. Right. And guess what else I asked her to do? Besides placing the valve take her piercing out. Exactly. Correct. And that was the hardest thing I think for her is because these piercings are so popular. But these piercings do have their consequences, especially if, they're, if they could cause an infection that could gain access to the bloodstream. Would you put tattooing in that same column? I would put anything that is done that is unsterile, right, and sterile where, you know, where you have to, um, we have access of bugs to gain access to the blood system. And there's certain people that are a much greater risk. And we know that people that are diabetic, you know, people that have immune systems that are weak. Right. Now, some people can get a bacteria in the blood and just throw it off. We know that people that have bad heart valves to begin with are at risk. Um, these are people, um, we know that people that have HIV infection are at higher risk of getting these effects because their immune systems are damaged. Right. So, um, is there any one certain age group where it occurs more? No, it can, well, in, in, it can happen in any age group, but um, the ones I see it most in are usually the middle, middle aged people, and it usually hap happens from some infection on the blood. Or, you know, one, one I saw not too long ago was a person had um, an infection on the leg that never healed, and they didn't go to the doctor, they didn't get antibiotics, right. and it got worse and worse and worse, and, and soon the infection got on the blood. Um, does all infections end up in the blood on the heart valves? No, it doesn't. And actually, there's, it, it's, it's, it's sort of rare that this would happen, but if it does, it's devastating. Correct. So I hope that, and you think that well, answers we've, we've, Rasmus's we've, uh, question? Let's see, we've um, discussed the different types of infections. We've discussed the different ways that you, that you can get those infections. What are some of the, the different treatments? Okay. That's, that's good to talk about that. If the infection is so bad that the valve is destroyed and the patient's having severe symptoms, there's nothing to do but replace the valve. And right. we've talked about the different valves, the metal valves, the pig valves, depending on the situation, the bleeding problems. 
Um, sometimes the infection is not so bad, it catches it early on, the symptoms are minimal. And in those cases, we can treat it with long-term IV antibiotics right. to help kill the bacteria. Um, but usually, even though you put them on long-term antib antibiotics, usually the bacteria damages the valve to some extent because mm -hmm. it's lived there for a while. Right. But in some instances, we can give six or eight weeks of IV antibiotics um, specific to that bacteria or whatever it is, and we can knock it out that way. Right. All righty. Let's go on to uh, question number four. This comes from Frances in Orlando, Florida. And she says that her heart valve does not open well. I am now getting short of breath. I might need a new heart valve. I live alone on a fixed income. I have no family nearby. Can you give me any advice? Well, Francis, from your question, I'm not exactly sure um, what, exactly what's going on here. Um, if you might need a new heart valve, in, in, if you're an elderly person, the most common heart valve that needs to be replaced is the aortic valve. And some people, just through the process of aging, that valve, the aortic valve, that's the one that leads out of the heart, just gets calcified so it doesn't open. I think of it, Dan, like rusting. You know, you right. just rust doesn't open good. An old house. An old house. Um, and, uh, now, we're not saying, Francis, that you're an old house, but the valve, no, not at all. The valve might not be opening like it Correct. should. If this is the case, um, you have to decide whether, this, you know, whether your quality of life would warrant a new a valve replacement. Um, and a valve replacement now, we're doing it very common. And what I tell my elderly people, it's according to how old they are. And I'll give you an example. I had someone come in the other day that was 87. And she had this aortic stenosis, and she mm -hmm. says, I've lived my life. I'm, I'm right with God. Um, I prefer just to live out my life. And, and, and she was having symptoms. You know, and, right. you know, short of breath was the most right. common one we see. Um, she chose that, and, and everything, you know, that was a good decision for her, and she didn't have any problems with that. Um, other people say, no, I have a, a lot to accomplish. I'm very active. I don't have right. a lot of other medical problems. And I replace heart valves in people up to 90 years old at times. We've right. sent them to the surgeons and they've had good outcomes. However, the older we get, the more chances of us having a surgical complication. And right. recovering from any heart surgery is difficult. So without a family nearby, um, you know, that could be a, a, little, a little bit tough, living alone. So this is a... a to this, rely more on friends and... and people that you know. You know I, I would just, Francis, I would just give this a lot of thought and talk to your family and a lot of prayer. Right. Prayer in this situation. Alrighty, number five is from Ashley in California. And she writes, I am 22 years old and have been told I have mitral valve prolapse. Okay. I like high intensity aerobic classes. Will this slow me down? Um, Ashley, it should not slow you down at all. Mitral valve prolapse is a condition that we have diagnosed commonly, and that's simply where the valve, the mitral valve, doesn't shut where it should. It right. shuts a little bit further back. And in some cases, the valve doesn't leak. In some patients, it leaks a little bit. Sometimes this valve can get thickened, and we give that a term called myxomatous. And if that valve's myxomatous, it tends to leak more. So the key is not so much having the mitral valve prolapse as whether it's, the valve is not closing well, so it leaks. Right. So that's the main thing um, we follow, Ashley, is, 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 will it, is it leaking very much? Um, the test we've already talked about that we, we do that with is an echocardiogram will right. tell us how much it's, it's leaking. Now, this valve is not a perfect valve. So in, in a patient like you, Ashley, I would say if you have mitral valve prolapse and the valve leaks, you have to be very careful around unsterile procedures, right. like dental procedures, anything unsterile, you would want to take some antibiotics before that procedure just right. to cover in case a bacteria could gain access to your bloodstream. Because in this type of valve, it could join it could join up with the valve and cause an infection. Right. Now, does medication, is, is medication an option for that situation? Usually, you don't need medications for this. Some people with mitral valve prolapse do have a lot of palpitations, or the mm -hmm. skip beats. If you have a lot of palpitations, or the skip beats, um, and we can't treat it with natural measures, 
um, such as exercise, low stress. We could put them on a medication that would block the skip beats, and right. those are called the beta blockers. But for you, Ashley, I think you're already doing the most in, important thing, and that's that high-intensity aerobics, because that's right. helping your system more. But you should take antibiotics if you have unsterile procedure. And we call that, let me go one, we call that dental prophylaxis, usually, because most of the procedures are done in the mouth. Right. So I would tell your dentist every time that I have this, and he'll give you an antibiotic before the procedure. Now, is there anything, in her life, for instance, that she can't do, let's say, go to Pikes Peak, different altitude, no. skin, scuba diving, anything like that. No, she can Nothing do all her. of that as long as the valve is not leaking too severely. Right. And most of the cases, it's not. It's not leaking too severely, and they can do whatever. In rare cases, though, it is leaking severely, mm -hmm. and in that case, it would need to go on. Now, since there's no infection in this valve, this valve is just not working well. In these instances, the valve, in some cases, need to be replaced. Right. Alrighty, our sixth question, Jim, is from Maxwell in England. His friend told him that he has four artificial heart valves. He thinks he is exaggerating. Can you have this many bad heart valves? That's a good question. Wow. Um, we talked earlier about the valves in the heart, and we identified the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, the mitral valve, and the aortic valve. Mm -hmm. I think, Maxwell, your friend is exaggerating. I've never seen anyone that had four heart valves replaced. I have seen one valve, very common. Sometimes I see two heart valves replaced, and usually these people have rheumatic heart fevers. Jim, what is rheumatic heart fevers? Rheumatic heart fever is a condition, usually it's been years ago, and people used to not get antibiotics for certain infections. And, mm -hmm. and usually people would get infections, not get treated with antibiotics. Um, the infections would gain access to the bloodstream. Subsequently, the bacteria or bugs would get on the valves and damage them. Mm -hmm. And in the healing process, these valves became thickened and didn't work correctly. We call that a rheumatic heart valve. Right. And these type of infections could get on multiple valves, and I've had seen people with up to three valves affected with rheumatic heart fever. But Maxwell, I've never seen four artificial heart valves. In fact, I've only seen two with the repair of one. The most common valves that we you know, have surgery on is the aortic valve, the mitral valve. Rarely, rarely do you have a tricuspid valve. And the pulmonic valve, they usually um, have other methods to help that valve when right. it gets, gets bad. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Max. Well, and if you really wanted to know for sure, you could look at your friend's medical records or he could have one of these tests called an echocardiogram. We've covered a lot of ground today about heart valvular disease. We've talked of leaky valves, whether a person should take Coumadin or not. We've talked about infections. And one of the things I want to leave with everyone today is make sure you're clean, especially with regards to your bloodstream, because um, we don't want an infection to gain access to your heart. Thank you for joining us today for Wonderfully Made. And may God richly bless you as you live close to him.